Here, the imperative is we cannot afford an ANC EFF government. And we think that another five years of ANC government will destroy this country. So do we want to save South Africa or not? South Africa is experiencing a fundamental political realignment. How will this play out? Well, joining me to discuss is R.W. Johnson. He is a well-known political scientist, commentator, and author. Bill Johnson, welcome to the show. Thank you. So, Bill, you've been writing quite extensively about South African history, South African politics for for many, many decades now. And uh, you first encountered the ANC as a as a young man in South Africa and then later abroad in the UK as well, in exile. Uh, so you got to know the organization pretty intimately. Uh, you documented the transition to democracy uh, and you've since played a very uh, significant role in public life in South Africa. So you know a thing or two about the ANC. What do you make of the current state of the organization? It seems to be at its weakest moment in its history. What do you make of- I, I think, the no, position? I don't think that's true. Um, look, people forget that the ANC was very weak uh, from its foundation through until after the Second World War. It was an organization accounting for very little in that period. It really began to take off only after the Second World War and particularly well into the 50s. It wasn't until at least the middle 50s that it began to take off. And uh, one of your oldest uh, and most faithful partners in race relations, uh, Jill. Uh, Jill Vincent, you know, yeah. Vincent, yeah. Now, Jill is an old Liberal Party, uh, old stager, and she will tell you that in the middle 50s, that when Mandela would call a strike for the ANC, he would come along to her and her husband saying, please, could the Liberal Party put its weight behind this in Soweto, because they then were a much bigger, stronger organization than the ANC, okay? The white Liberal Party had more supporters in Soweto than they did. Now, that gives you some idea of just how weak it was. It really mushroomed only in the late, late 50s uh, and the 60s, the early 60s. And of course, it was then because they then went over to uh, armed struggle, which was a complete mistake and disaster, uh, they then got nipped in the bud, as it were. So then they were mainly an exile organization until uh, very late on. So to say they're at their weakest now actually isn't historically true, but of course they are at their weakest in the modern period, uh, starting again in 1990. They haven't been this weak uh, uh, before. And I think they're continuing to decline. Uh, and that two points about that, really. One is that, you know, the whole idea of the ANC was to bring together the, the disparate and squabbling, essentially tribal groups uh, in which chiefs played a very large part. And that was seen as a very difficult thing to achieve. And of course, you can now see just why that was, because it has fallen back into factionalism uh, very much. And I think that is, frankly, a, a truthful depiction of the realities of, of black society in South Africa. It is not naturally a united organization or a united community at all. And actually, I would expect the factionalism to get worse rather than better. Uh, if I've just been talking to someone from Zimbabwe and she was saying to me, you know, that Zanu PF, that the factionalism has just got steadily worse and worse and worse. So that now, instead of two factions, there are about five. And that it's just endemic and it just carries on getting worse, basically. And I think that uh, what was exceptional was the period of militant struggle when they had one overwhelming charismatic leader, initially to Lutuli and later on Mandela. Uh, and that, that was the exceptional period. And we are now in what is in a sense much more normal. And I don't think they will easily go back from where they are now to where they were before. 
And it's not very politically fashionable to discuss the role of tribalism in the ANC's internal factional disputes. It's often the way that it's portrayed is around personalities, Jacob Zuma versus Ramaphosa or Ace Magashule, whoever it might be. Uh, but there does seem to be these kind of lingering underlying tensions and these schisms along tribal lines. Look, it's ridiculous that fashion should play any role in this. Uh, and we have to go with what's real. And uh, of course, factionalism is not by any means always tribal. But there is no doubt whatsoever that, uh, you know, when Mbeki and Mandela were in charge, that there was a coarser predominance within the upper ranks of the ANC, which is still there at uh, civil servant level. And that when Zuma came in, that you had a Zulu predominance. And the, uh, the whole point about the Ramaphosa period is he does not have a big vendor following. He's on his own, he's isolated. Therefore, he's very weak. Therefore, he temporizes, he delays, he hesitates because he has no real backing of that sort. And that it's quite clear that that still plays a very fundamental role. And that, um, and moreover, I mean, I think it was Mbeki who pointed out that almost every minister who came in immediately swapped his director general for someone from his own tribal group. I mean, you know, this is just reality, whether you like it or not. I don't care whether it's factual or not to call it a spade or spade, but it is. Um, but there are other sorts of factions as well, as we know. I mean, ideological ones, but the real problem is that it's not going away. But on top of that, an analogy I used recently in a talk I gave is in 1961 in the Soviet Union, Khrushchev announced that soon the next generation would see in the arrival of communism. And in 20 years, that the Soviet Union would transit from being a socialist society to being a communist one, which was seen as meaning an era of abundance and in everything, and uh, when er all the problems would be sorted out, and indeed the state would begin withering away, as Marx had predicted. Now Brezhnev then came in and said, no, 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 we're going to stay a socialist society, but it was a bit late. People had got this idea, and when the early 80s rolled around, they looked around, and of course there were queues everywhere and shortages, and the people in power were not achieving very much and the economy had ceased to grow. And they looked and realized that, you know, all of this is nonsense. And that actually, uh, it ain't like that at all. And that was a very key thing because it delegitimized the system. They realized, look, our politicians are very ordinary people and they're telling us a lot of fibs and it's not at all like that. And this is just not true. And I think it's no accident that within a few years, Gorbachev came along and, you know, things were just falling to bits by then. Now, I think something similar, we've reached a similar stage of the ANC. After all these more than 25 years of saying a better life for all, people are looking around saying, well, it's not a better life for all. It's actually worse for most people. And unemployment is more than quadrupled since the ANC came in. And poverty and inequality are much worse than they used to be and that this is actually not as good as the apartheid society that preceded it in many key respects. Education's worse, public hospitals are worse, the roads have got more potholes, the electricity doesn't work, and so on and so forth. And I think in the same sense that what is happening at mass level is this process of delegitimation. And it's undoubtedly going on and it is proceeding. It hasn't by any means finished yet. It's most advanced in the urban areas, but it is seeping into the rural areas too. And without much doubt, the ANC vote is now going to depend more and more on duress, basically people being threatened by their chiefs or by other people in, in their squad camps and wherever, or on bribery and threats of, if you don't vote for us, you lose your pension or you lose your social grant or whatever, you know. And that, that sort of thing is going on already, but they are going to become more and more dependent on it. So uh, that is where we're at now. And where does this leave President Ramaphosa? Because he has overseen this 
kind of slow and steady decline in the organization. There was great hope that he was going to be the architect of a new dawn or a rebirth, uh, but the Renaissance just hasn't quite arrived. And he seems politically to still be in a fairly strong position within the ANC. Uh, there are no direct challenges uh, there are the indeed, upcoming uh, conference. But... Because the Zoom is running against him. I don't know how you can say that. Okay, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, most of the action seems to be at the deputy president level, but yeah. I yeah, but that's point. anticipating the presidency after that. Look, there's a direct challenge for president, and there are other challenges as well. Look, he's in a very difficult situation. He's still their most popular card, but, uh, and in that sense, he's probably the most likely to win, but his position is very weak. You can surely see that. And of course, it isn't just that he hasn't quite succeeded. He hasn't succeeded at all. And things are clearly worse now than when he took over uh, in most respects. Uh, certainly unemployment's higher, poverty's worse, inequality's worse and so on. And um, people's real incomes have been falling uh, for quite some time now, for years on end. Uh, and in all sorts of respects, South Africa is going backwards. Even literacy is declining. The railways are worse. Um, the electricity, the water situation is much worse. The sewer situation. I mean, I could go through a great litany, but uh, you know, he's not achieving what he said at all, and things are continuing to deteriorate. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But um, so, I mean, the ANC is in a very difficult position, and within the ANC, he is in also a very difficult and very weak position. So I think that's where we are. And, you know, in terms of the, uh, the role of outside actors, uh, I'm thinking specifically of the economic freedom fighters. Uh, they, in many ways, are a disgruntled, disaffected faction of the ANC in exile. It's the ANC Youth League in exile. Uh, what role do you see them playing in the, the broader mix of ANC politics? Well, uh, you know, it, it, we're talking about potential roles. Aren't we? It does look as if they are moving towards uh, some sort of coalition arrangement with the ANC, uh, because if the ANC do fall below 50, they will be the most obvious coalition partner. And I personally am very struck by the fact that if you take AXA, the airports company, that the CEO now is Mpomi Ampofu, the wife of Dali Ampofu, who was the national chairman of the EFF. Now, this looks to me very much as if state patronage is already being shared with the EFF. And obviously, any deal will involve cutting them in. It's like Italy. Cutting you in on the patronage is how uh, a, a coalition government works in Italy, and it will obviously be the same here because that's what's important to both those parties. And it looks as if that's already started. Uh, so it does seem to me they're moving towards that. And that, of course, is a very threatening situation uh, in all sorts of ways. Um, I don't know whether I need to spell them out to you. Well, why don't you? Well, obviously, Look, the FF wants expropriation, etc. It wants to nationalize all industries. I don't suppose it would get all of that, but it will exercise pressure for those things. And as you know, that's the very last thing we need is, is more nationalization and so on. Uh, and in addition, of course, they are clearly very much the same as the RET faction, the same mixture of left populist rhetoric and looting uh, quite straightforwardly. We've seen that with the vendor, the VBS bank and so on. And um, so the entry of the EFF into government would signal uh, partially, it would sig signal partly a return to a sort of Zuma style period. It would almost, I mean, uh, you know, he has, Malena has strong links with Zuma and the RET faction as it is. It would strengthen their position in the ANC. And of course, Malema is determined to become president and he would probably want the deputy presidency, but if he didn't get that immediately, he would certainly be in a very powerful position with any such government. And it would be very, very bad for all investors, local and uh, foreign. It would cause almost certainly an investment strike. 
uh, it would also see further emigration of skilled and professional people. And he is, party is also very anti-Indian and anti-white. And it would also be alarming for colored people because Jimmy Manu involved probably. So, you know, it would be about as bad news as you could possibly get really, and uh, very, very threatening. And it would almost certainly give a very strong push to secessionist sentiment in various parts of the country because people would take one look and say, we do not want to be under such a government. We'd rather look after ourselves. So I think it would be a fatal move uh, and that uh, the ANC uh, would find it difficult to come back from that. I don't know how, whether they are fully aware of this, but I think that it would set in motion things they couldn't control. Uh, Julius Malema has been quite coy about joining any uh, ANC-led government at the local level. Uh, is that because he's keeping his powder dry uh, in order to extract maximum advantage later on in the 2024 general elections? Or do you think he's more, is, is it perhaps more of a nihilistic impulse? It's better to uh, cause chaos from without, not have the burden of, of having to govern anything. No, I don't think either of those things. I think that Malema is the shrewdest uh, tactical and perhaps strategic, but certainly tactical operator that we have in this country. He's better than anyone in the ANC or the DA in that sense, I think. And, you know, it's not long ago that you had a situation which is the EFF with 11% of the vote was in a situation where they were driving the agenda of the ANC and pushing them into this expropriation thing. And simultaneously, while they were half controlling what was going on in the ruling party, they were also calling the shots in local governments in many of the metropoles in coalition or supporting arrangements with the DA. Now, it's pretty amazing to get an 11% party, which is calling the shots uh, for the two bigger parties to its right and its left. Remarkable. Now, you know, you've got to give him credit for this. He is a very smart operator. Now, I think the point about Malema is that he understood that the EFF is not big enough to take over and have control of any particular metropole or even smaller municipality. He doesn't want to get into a coalition arrangement where he has to take formal responsibility for what goes on in a municipality when in fact he doesn't have control. So, he therefore wants to limit the relationship to one where he gives support, but is not held responsible by voters for what then happens. And that's his maximal position, because that gives him a position where he can extract concessions from the ruling group, whichever it is, uh, but he doesn't have to take any responsibility for what goes on. I think that's his best posture in terms of, of political gains. And when I interviewed Tony Leon in this show, he said that any potential coalition between the ANC and the EFF could drive a wedge within the ANC itself and actually lead to a split in the ANC. How plausible do you think that is? Well, you know, it's possible, but I wouldn't bet on it because, look, you know, the ANC, are, the, the people tend to be very loyal to it. And, uh, you know, uh, when there have been splits away, people mainly have clung to the ANC, and the ANC is the source of patronage after all, which is what matters. And, um, you know, when Zuma took over, Cope did depart, it's true. But otherwise, most people, including people like Trevor Manuel and people who might not have, they hung on. They didn't resign. They didn't split away, most of them. They said, oh, well, you know, I'm still ANC. So I think that that loyalist instinct is very strong. And while some people would be very offended and wouldn't like it, and they would on the whole be the better element of the ANC and the sort of anti-corruption people, uh, they would be a minority, I think. Yeah, and I think that patronage is the glue that holds everything together in the ANC, which I guess raises the question that as 
the fiscal situation of South Africa deteriorates and sources of funding uh, potentially dry up, they may not be able to keep that patronage system fueled and that might lead to disruptions within the alliance. Yeah, well, that of course is going on and don't forget that in addition to the huge pressures for a basic income grant, uh, which we can't afford, uh, and NHI, which is an even bigger ask, which also we can't afford, that, uh, you know, the ANC itself continues to come up with these fantastic proposals for large scale expenditure, a state bank, a state pharmaceutical company, now a state oil company. A second ESCOM. A second ESCOM, yeah. Now, this is all, I mean, it's where they're still in the situation they were way back in the early 90s when they were putting together the RDP. Because the RDP was a great big, uncosted, unbudgeted wish list. That's all it was. A great big series of what we're going to spend money on. It being assumed that the state would come up with the money, you know, with no idea about where it would actually come from. No proposals for taxation or anything. Just... You know, it's assumed that it grows on trees. Now, they're still doing that as if there's no need for any fiscal discipline at all. But of course, there is. And the thing that really one has to keep a tight hold of is that world interest rates are rising quite sharply and are going to continue to rise. And every quarter percent they go up means that we pay a higher interest bill on our large debt which is also going up. And that is going to squeeze expenditure very hard. We're getting close. We're going to end up paying a quarter of all the budget on interest charges before long. And that will mean sweeping cuts in other forms of expenditure. There's no two ways about it. So, um, you know, all of this spending stuff is pie in the sky. And as you say, there's going to be a tremendous squeeze on everything else. And in your book, How Long Will South Africa Survive, uh, which I'd highly recommend, I think much of it still holds up. I think it was written about 2016 or so. Um, you know, you highlighted the potential scenario that as South Africa's fiscal situation breaks down, as the investment climate becomes ever more hostile, that this could effectively bankrupt the state and lead the ANC government into the awaiting arms of the IMF with a structural adjustment type program. And it seems the IMF has moved away from structural adjustment as its preferred policy. So during COVID, them giving a lot of uh, concessional loans and, and grants and so on. Do you think that some kind of external actor like the IMF uh, could impose some fiscal discipline on the ANC? Look, there's nothing like the IMF. There's only the IMF. Uh, the idea that uh, the, the BRICS bank would, is, is not viable. So. We're only talking about the IMF. Um, look, since I wrote that, two things, they got two very big lucky breaks. One was the resetting of the statistical framework, which showed that actually GDP was 11% bigger than they'd thought. That meant that the debt was proportionally smaller. And secondly, of course, the commodities boom, which artificially and or temporarily pushed up our uh, receipts, which are now back in deficit. But those two things did help a lot. Now, the net result is that we are currently, our debt is closing in on about 75% of GDP, which is high. But as I say, the interest charges are going up so that we're actually going to be paying more interest on 75 than when we thought it was 90. Uh, and so and, you know, our budget deficit is running at about 5% or 6% a year, unless it changes. So that 75 is going up every time by another 5% or so. Very, so we'll quickly be in really deep water. So in, we're not there at the moment, but that, as you say, that scenario has not gone away. And indeed, if you have to go to the IMF, uh, it doesn't matter what the current fashions are. Uh, look, if you go to the IMF while running budget deficits of 5 or 6%, they will say, well, look, how are you going to pay us back? Any banker will say the same. And, you know, you can't pay us back while you're running deficits like that. So the first thing is you've got to stop doing that. 
And indeed, you've got to run a surplus so that you can start paying back. Now, even though you don't go further than that, that would re require huge changes, uh, which would be a structural adjustment program, whether you call it that or not. You know, there's no way around it. All right, well, let's turn back now to party politics, because the, the big issue is really what happens in the run-up to 2024. And the opposition parties are going to be playing a significant role as well. We've discussed the EFF, which is its own special kind of creature. Um, but what about the current state of the DA, as you see it? Are they going to be equipped adequately to deal with this formidable challenge of attempting to unseat the ANC from power in 24? Well, they obviously can't do it on their own. Um, which is why I raised the, the notion of some wider popular front of some sort, because uh, the DA's weakness uh, is, well, I mean, they have several problems, but their main weakness, of course, is they cannot offer an alternative government. And that is what people would like. I think to a large extent, people in South Africa have still got a framework in their mind derived from the older period when, you know, with first past the post and constituencies, you had an alternative government and you had uh, in, in mind. So if you, you either, you could either have the UP or you could have the NAP sort of thing. And uh, that was the situation. And the, the weakness always of the Progressive Party is they couldn't offer an alternative. And the DA are still in that position. So they can only offer, a, and I think people would like to know uh, what they're getting if they're not going to have the ANC. They want to believe in some viable alternative. Otherwise, you're voting for a sort of vacuum or you're not sure what. Do you so, think that's a fair assessment? I mean, they've been in power in the Western Cape, various municipalities as well, coalition governments in most no, major metros. They can't offer because... Uh, you know, even the, the more optimistic polls are showing them around about 25%. And I'm not saying anything they would dissent from, I'm sure, but that means that everyone knows that you need, you know, 50 and that they're only halfway. So you can't offer a viable alternative. And that is a big problem. And I think that, you know, the, 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 you've got to realize that in a, a, a proportional representation system, but this is normally the situation because PR has the effect of pushing the vote out into, since everybody can get represented, that it maximizes the utility of having a separate and distinct identity right across the spectrum, as it were. So every party tries to go for its own particular grouping. It's unusual in a PR system to get a party with 50. Uh, I mean, in Europe, where you have PR quite commonly, you never get a 50% party. Even in Germany, uh, the CDU, even in West Germany, it only managed it once ever. Uh, and it's very long way from that now. We are gradually getting into that situation ourselves, where as the ANC goes under 50, so it will also become unheard of here. Now, once you're in that situation, the problem you've then got normally, I mean, I'm just speaking as a political scientist really now, <clears throat> is that in election campaigns, in a PR system like that, <clears throat> you emphasize the differences between your parties because that is your distinctive, you know, unique selling point that you've got. And that brings out your particular, your maximal <clears throat> and, and uh, differentiated audience. And then when all the voting's over, uh, then you sit down to bargain. And you can see that in Germany, they often bargain for a month or more uh, and then form some sort of contract with government. And the great weakness of this <clears throat> is that, let us say that you are in Germany uh, or France or wherever, it doesn't matter where it take any country at random. You campaign furiously as alternative for Germany or uh, the SPD or the Greens or whatever it is. And everyone votes for you keen on your green agenda or whatever you say, your anti-immigrant agenda or whatever it was. But then when the voting's gone, you sit down and start bargaining and making compromises with people who are quite different from you. 
And so your voters are left rather open mouth because they voted for one thing and the politicians immediately start making deals between themselves, which you had no inkling about and you didn't know a thing about. And uh, it's very undemocratic. Uh, and that's the nature of making these coalitions that you didn't know until after the election what you were going to get. Now, I think the way around that for the DA is to form some sort of wider united front with other groups which are not ANC to try to offer an alternative, which is a national alternative. It would by definition be a loose grouping where they all retain their separate party identities. But I think that way they could offer, if they had some common program, have to be a minimum program, which they could agree in advance, then at least they could offer the country saying, if you vote for us, this is roughly what you will get. And I think people want to have that sort of clarity and it would strengthen their appeal and make their, their bid more realistic. Yeah, and uh, in preparation for this interview, I was reading your book, uh, South Africa, uh, the first man, the last nation. Uh, and in the in the preface, uh, you, you say, we have to face the sad truth that South Africa, with the end of apartheid, exchanged one set of authoritarian hegemonic nationalists for another, and that many of the hopes of liberation have faded as the similarities between these two hegemonies have multiplied. Mm. So could this broader popular front, perhaps with the DA at its apex, could that form this a new, more liberal democratic alternative to the historical uh, hegemonic nationalism that we've seen in the past in South Africa? That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yes, it would, it would indeed be a very different sort of alternative. It, it, it might include the Freedom Front Plus. In fact, I'm sure it would. But it wouldn't offer, as you say, anything like the old Afrikaner nationalists or the African nationalists. It would be a separate middle ground uh, alliance and it would have to, as I say, have a minimum program, uh, but you know, it would be a safe South African program in effect, saying, look, we've got to reestablish law and order. We've got to stop the gangs taking over this country, which are doing it, the various construction mafias, taxi mafias, et cetera. And uh, we've got to get economic growth going again. Uh, you know, there are certain big things that just have to be done. Yeah, and I think that, one of the the big concerns would be like, do these parties actually have the numbers to do it? Uh, and you could have this kind of interregnum where, uh, you know, the ANC is quite low. Uh, they could potentially go in with the EFF. Um, do you think this motley assortment of of opposition parties could get the numbers uh, sufficiently high to actually get into power? And you know, I think we've been talking a lot, my colleagues and I, about the wild dogs thesis and you know it's the ANC if you consider it to be the the big mighty buffalo uh, if the wild dogs can gang together they can take down the buffalo the problem with the wild dogs is that you know some of them like to yap at each other um, and some of them have rabies uh, some of them are not not always that keen to cooperate with one another and Sigmund Freud spoke about the narcissism of small difference um, and you know if you consider what really divides action South Africa with the DA, it's not, not that much, perhaps maybe on immigration, uh, but they actually spend more time uh, harping on at each other uh, rather than the main task of defeating the ANC. Well, personally, I think that analogies drawn from African wildlife are ridiculous and have, I think, absolutely nothing to do with uh, what we're talking about. Uh, I, I look at it more as a political scientist and are very conscious of the fact that the popular front movement of the interwar period in France, Italy, Spain, and so on, uh, well, France and Spain particularly, uh, they created exactly what I'm talking about. That, I mean, in, in the case of France, for example, you've got the uh, left radicals, middle of the ground party, middle party, uh, socialists and communists, and they form a single popular front with a minimum program. Now, by doing that, they offered the French people something they hadn't had before, which was a coherent alternative left-wing government. And people who had dreamt all their lives of getting such a thing, suddenly were told, look, you can have it. 
We've agreed to bury our differences. God knows they are strong enough. They've been fighting one another for years. But we are so frightened by the rise of fascism in, in Germany next door, and we cannot allow that in France. So we've got to stop it. And that's what we're all determined to do. Now, the result of that was to create a momentum and an elan, which greatly increased the vote of that party, of that front. So that in 1936, the Popular Front got far more votes than the separate parties had got prior to that because they were able to offer that alternative government. Now, uh, and something similar happened in Spain. So that is the model in my mind. And I do think that if you can offer, and of course, what was very euphoric for people in France was the thought that, you know, up until then, the socialists and communists had referred to as les frères ennemis, the brother enemies, right? Because they always fought bitterly. They were rivals for the same voters, you know? And to see them bury the hatchet and say, you are our brothers and we are willing to work together because we're both frightened of this much worse alternative was a wonderful thing for ordinary French working class people. And they came out and voted in huge numbers for them. Now, I think that here the imperative is we cannot afford an ANC EFF government. And we think that another five years of ANC government will destroy this country. So do we want to save South Africa or not? And that's a big enough overall objective. And it's saying there's a much worse alternative out there, which has to be avoided. And I think that that is, is the way to look at this. And that that would, I hope, and I think very it could very realistically increase the vote for that front and its constituent parties. All right. And what role do you foresee the DA playing in this broader popular front? Do they have what it takes to, to drive well, the coalition? Well, it play a predominant role. Look, by definition, if you have a, a contract between these parties saying we will agree, a common program, then you're all bound to it equally. And uh, that's very important. So they cease to be the leaders in the sense that they may be the bigger party, but they are just as bound to it as, you know, the, the UDM or IFP or the Mashaba's party, or whatever. And, um, but nonetheless, they would be the largest single block within it. And they uh, would quite likely be the biggest gainers in vote terms because uh, what has tended to happen in popular front movements is that the party which takes the initiative in driving the popular front tends to be identified with that and to gain the most politically. You can't be sure of that, but it, it might well work that way. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, it might not. Uh, equally, clearly there are many African voters who don't wish to vote for a, what they still think of as a white party. So they might say, well, I want to offer, I want to go for that uh, broad front, but I'll vote for Mashaba as a way of doing it. You know, well, okay, cater for that. Give them the Mashaba option, you know, or UDM or an IFP. <coughs> it gives you that sort of menu of alternatives. All right. Well, say they succeed and they take over the keys to the union buildings. What then? Uh, because the capacity of the state has declined so significantly even over just the last few years as we've been discussing. Can this breakdown of state capacity be reversed and what would it take to get South Africa back on the right track should this popular front take power? Well, uh, it's a good point. Uh, I think that, you know, what you would have to do uh, is well, something analogous to what had to happen in a number of municipalities where the DA took over. You would face a civil service which was full of deployed cadres, and you would have to say to them, listen, we know that you're all there because you're ANC. We won't sack you because of that. We don't care what your private politics are, provided you can and will do the things that we need you to do. But if you either will not, or if you do not have the capacity, then we are going to have to either remove you 
or to appoint new people who will do the things that you're unable or unwilling to do. And that would lead to a certain shakeout and so on at that level. I think that would be inevitable and you'd have to do it. But um, I think once you established that, you know, you were in charge and you were darling well going to force through certain things, and it would be clear. I mean, if you start, you know how popular some of these things would be. If you could set up a proper police force, which really started to crack down on crime and started putting in jail uh, people who really ought to have been there for some time, that would be extremely popular, as you know. And um, some of the other things which we're talking about too, you know, getting the water sorted out, really getting going on alternative uh, electricity. I mean, you know, people would cheer for every little bit of improvement you could do. And just stopping the corruption. Uh, you know, all of these things are, are highly popular things politically. So, uh, you know, it's, it's in a sense, but you're, you're right that the state is very weak and you would have to reinforce it, particularly at the top levels, but you would have to, you know, that would take time. That's the problem with it. And you would want to act quickly. Uh, so there's a problem there, which you, you can't really get around. But nonetheless, I think you, you would be able to make progress steadily. Yeah, and part of the strategy could be allowing for greater devolution, particularly to local governments or to provinces that uh, have the capacity to uh, administer their affairs in a, a more a clean... No, no I, I think that's right. But again, the capacity is lacking in most cases, you know. Uh, I mean... <laughs> yeah, the Eastern Cape's very different. Frankly, Western you Cape. know, in my own old city of Durban, I mean, it wouldn't really matter how much more autonomy you gave to them, it would still be hopeless because they, you've got a hopeless ANC council, which is totally thieving, frankly, and hopeless. All right. Well, to the question, the title of your book, uh, Can South Africa Survive? I mean, what future do you see for South Africa as we know it as a unitary state? Because that's only existed since 1910. It's essentially a political construction. Uh, we've had uh, many evolutions of that. Uh, but you know, essentially what we're talking about in this conversation is a, uh, an outcome between either a Marxist-Leninist organization in coalition with an African nationalist organization versus this popular front, broadly liberal democratic, let's say. There's some situations in between. But what happens if we get that Marxist-Leninist African nationalist coalition, things really start to go awry? Could well, we've already break got up it. of South Africa? No, we've already got that. Look, I think there's no doubt that, look, even if we, if the ANC gets 51% and carries on as now, uh, it does look very much as if another five years of ANC government would see further decline, uh, further breaking up of the infrastructure, further weakening of the state, uh, and faute de mieux, it would see greater autonomy because that would just have to happen, you know, that for ordinary life to go on, people would have to start doing things for themselves because the government wasn't doing them. And I think that, uh, you know, what we can see at the moment is, is that criminal gangs are moving into that space and that these various mafias uh, which are now, you know, very widespread and are not only demanding money from property developers and builders, but from mines and farms and government departments and you know what. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of Franz Cornier's scenario from a few years back where he thought that that's what we were heading to, that we would have a sort of enclave society where there would be an enclave in which life for the middle classes would go on, you know, with private security, private schools, private health, and so on, a little bubble in which they could live. But outside that, where the gangs would rule the urban South Africa, and the, the chiefs and their strong men would rule rural South Africa, and that there would be very little law and order, except what had been privatized by the gangs or the chiefs. Uh, and we are moving towards that, you know. The ANC is so impotent that uh, 
they can't stop that. And I think another five years just of the ANC would see a tremendous progression towards that. Yeah, and I'm sure many people see the uncertainty that awaits over the next couple of years, uh, and it instills in them uh, fear and trepidation of what might materialize. But uh, I wouldn't say that uh, you are a naive optimist, but you've always seen uh, the glass half full, if you will, uh, in terms of the South African situation. I was reminded of this passage from uh, your book, Foreign Native, uh, which was a memoir of sorts. And uh, you say, Africa, especially South Africa, is often so disturbing, so saddening, so gladdening, and just plain interesting that once you've lived here long enough, it's hard to live anywhere else. And uh, you tell this anecdote of uh, somebody who returns from Australia, and he says uh, you know, that it was a rather bland place. He says it was a relief to get back to abnormality when he arrived back in South Africa. I think I'll use that line a bit more, more frequently myself. But uh, you know, do, do you see us kind of muddling along in the, the same uh, uncertain state, but you know, somehow uh, managing to get things together? What is your kind of your view of the next five years? Well, I, I, you know, it does depend on what happens politically to some extent. But look, at the moment, we are in a state of regression. We are moving backwards. And, you know, you've really got to take that on board because historically this is unusual. As we know, I mean, the European Dark Ages were just such a period, a very frightening period, uh, where things go backwards. And that was basically caused, as we know, by the pirates in the Mediterranean interrupting the flow of grain from Egypt to Western Europe, which created conditions of starvation right across the continent. And thus, the only way to feed yourself for winter was to go and raid the next door community. So it meant everybody against everybody else, and only the strong could survive. And the only way you could get through was having a robber baron under whose wings you clustered and hope that he could beat the other robber barons. And that was what the Dark Ages were about. Now, here, as I say, we're in a situation where things are not stable. It's not a matter of muddling through. We're not muddling through now. Uh, we are actually in a state of, of regression, of decline, if you like, and that will continue under ANC government. There's, look, man, uh, Ramaphosa has not turned that trend around at all. It has continued on down under him. And uh, I would expect if he gets back in with an ANC majority, then I think that trend will continue. Uh, I, I don't see him it, it even leveling out. And what do you make of some of these emergent uh, secessionist movements? I mean, there's been this Cape independence movement. It seems a very small group of people at the moment, but do you think that this could gain some currency? Could we see similar moves in places like KwaZulu-Natal? Look, it's always a possibility in Natal. Natal does feel separate and different. And it isn't just the old white federalists and so on. Uh, you know, it's, it's always at one remove for the Zulu kingdom and so on. And the truth is, Natal would make a very decent country on its own. It's got that wonderful, it's got the two biggest ports. It's got, uh, you know, it can feed itself very good. It gets half of all the rainfall in the country. Uh, it's very rich agriculturally. Uh, you know, it could make sense as a country. Uh, so, um, and it's got a predominant group. I mean, you know, if you just have a KZN on its own, then there's an overwhelming Zulu majority but you've also got a very strong, educated and entrepreneurial Indian population and a substantial white population. So that uh, there's a lot of skills and uh, money and so forth there, which uh, would make it a, a viable state if it wanted to be. And in the Western Cape, I don't see secession happening. Although, as I say, if you've got an ANC EFF coalition, it would push the secessionist option strongly. And you must realize that in the Western Cape, you know, every DA voter you talk to says that, oh, of course, I would love an independent Cape or a more autonomous one. But that's at the moment I'm voting DA and so on. But i.e., they're the same people. Um, the small minority, which is putting the idea of secession before the choice of a DA government, is just a subset of the DA voters. That's all. But most of the other DA voters would like it, 
so that uh, they're, they're very much overlapping categories. The uh, look, what is already happening here is moves towards autonomy. Already, there are 1,000 effectively policemen belonging to a sort of municipal police force, okay? And they have managed to push down crime rates in key areas, which is a major step. That's despite Becky Kelly saying it's, they're having their own police force would be over his dead body. In effect, they've got one. Secondly, they are planning to have their own electricity within three to four years and to become independent on that front. And thirdly, they're negotiating to take over the railways. So on all those fronts, you can see a growing autonomous trend. And I would think that would continue. You, you know as well as I do. If they get, look, on this question of cities developing their own electricity, the key point, not only for residents, but for businesses. Now, if Cape Town alone, of all the metropoles, is in a position to guarantee no power cuts, there will be a flood of businesses to the Cape. And uh, already, frankly, I notice it even in my own area that, you know, the houses which are on sale here get stacked up and some of them are exchanged for prices more than the asking price. And this is because of people coming down here from Joburg and Durban and whatever. And it, it is a strong magnet that uh, things work better here. And if they get their own electricity, that will only increase enormously. So, Bill, just as we bring this conversation to a close, how would you advise ordinary South Africans who might be listening to our conversation to prepare for the turbulence that awaits over the next few years? Well, it's very difficult to advise, isn't it? Um, look, I think most people feel that the best thing is to be as self-sufficient as you can. You know, I think what people do is they club together in their communities, and uh, in many of the smaller towns, I think it, it boils down to Afri Forum and solidarity, certainly in African speaking areas. Um, I think they're playing a very constructive role in that respect. But uh, in other towns, it, it's less clear what to do. Uh, I think in KZN during the riots, uh, one of the things that was very striking was how the Indian community, particularly the Muslim parts of it, played a very strong role basically as vigilantes, uh, and in preventing rioting, reaching certain areas. Uh, that was a surprise, but a very welcome surprise to many whites, I think. Um, so it depends on your area and what, what the key elements are in that area. Uh, you know, so I think it, it does depend locally on what's available to you. If you enjoyed this conversation and you're watching on YouTube, please do give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And if you're listening on your preferred podcast platform, please do subscribe there as well. My name is David Ansara. Until next time, take care.